The Unshackled Waves, episode 143. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The week in Australian politics was still dominated by Malcolm Turnbull's 30 consecutive news poll losses. A side effect of this was the uh, alleged cabinet leak that uh, suggested that Peter Dutton, uh, the Home Affairs Minister, wanted to reduce Australia's annual immigration intake by 20,000. It has put him as the front runner in a possible leadership spill. And the final results of the Australian Electoral Commission redistributions were announced. Victoria gained a seat, the ACT gained a seat, and South Australia lost a seat. The coalition majority is gone, and the parliament has increased from 150 to 151 seats. The coalition of the US, UK, and France attacked Syria after an alleged uh, chemical weapons attack by the Assad regime. Uh, many of Trump's supporters are feeling betrayed and wondering if the newly installed National Security Advisor John Bolton is responsible for this change in policy. The Australian regressives are at it again. Yasmin abdul Magid, she has got a new show on the ABC, a hijab fashion show, and she was also later in the week kicked out of the United States for having the wrong visa. The Human Rights Commission, under their Race Discrimination Commissioner Tim Supomasani, issued a new report claiming there were too many white people in positions of power in Australia. Now, to discuss the week's news, we are joined by Senior Editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry. Damien, welcome back to the show. Good to be here, Tim. Now, I thought we'd start off by having quite a nerdy political uh, discussion because the Australian Electoral Commission has just announced the uh, redistributions for the House of Representatives for the next federal election. Now, we'll start in the state of Victoria. Now, that was announced uh, last week. Uh, Victoria goes from 37 House of Representative seats to 38, uh, but it's not just the creation of a new seat which is interesting. It's also the knock-on effect by the uh, redistributing of all the other uh, seats in Victoria. And it looks like that the Labor Party has gained quite well from this redistribution. They've gained uh, 2.5 uh, more seats in uh, this redistribution. They've gained the new seat of Fraser, named after Malcolm Fraser, which will be in Western Melbourne, a safe uh, Labor stronghold. They've also gained uh, the marginal Liberal electorate of Dunkley, which is around the Frankston area. That becomes marginal Labor. And they've also basically brought back 50-50, uh, the seat of Kerengamite held by uh, Sarah Henderson, which will now become Cox, which is basically which, as I mentioned, it's the Liberal margins are wiped out. So, yes, Labor's done very well in Victoria. They have, and Labor, I mean, Victoria has always been their stronghold where they, um, they've they always uh, been, that's where their base was in Victoria. And by, the, by looking at this redistribution, it's really helped them to gain, and it's going to be very hard for the Liberals to... Uh, be able to capitalise and um, to be able to gain seats in Victoria now, when it was never, um, you know, a state that that favoured them traditionally. Um, Karangamite is a seat that's um, going to be interesting to watch. It does seem like it will be a seat that will be lost to Labor. So when you look at that, plus the other seats that were gained there with Dunkley and also the new seat of Fraser, that's already free in the bag now that we're seeing Labor getting in the next election. So. It's um, going to be very interesting how um, how it works. It's going to definitely help them uh, gain government, which is looking to be uh, a reality when you're looking at polls and, and everything like that at the moment. So it's going to be very interesting indeed. Now, Sarah Henderson, she's objected to the redistribution. The reason why it's being renamed uh, Karangamite to Cox is because uh, Lake Karangamite, which the seat was named after, has uh, been taken out of the electorate. So the Electoral Commission thought to rename it Cox in honour of May Cox, who was a, a local swimming coach in the uh, Surf Coast area. But uh, Sarah Henderson, 
who has just invited uh, mockery for this, uh, is objecting to the name change because she doesn't want to be known as the member for Cox, or she doesn't want her call flute saying delivering for Cox, or the Speaker in Parliament to say the member for Cox with, will withdraw. And I never thought, she's, you know, she's saying other people will make jokes, but she's the one who's brought this up. When, when I first heard it was being renamed, it was like, okay, like, you know, I, I, I didn't have a pure old mind and say, huh, you know, I, but of course, you know, now she's brought it on herself and now there's going to be endless Cox jokes. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I never would have thought anything either. I see the name Cox and I mean, it's a very common surname. It's a, it's a, a very, uh, a common English name and it's nothing that, uh, I would have thought, uh, was funny or that, uh, you know, I mean, it, it yeah, it's a, I mean, most people wouldn't really. I mean, um, it, it's just a common name. And if she hadn't said anything, then nobody would have thought anything of it. But for her to uh, object to it and make a scene, um, she's just uh, invited the ridicule over um, over to her, which is, uh, I mean, she has nothing to worry about anyway, because uh, it, it's most likely she'll never be um, the member for Cox <laughs> uh, when it comes to the, the election coming up because she won't win um, considering that she's on a 50-50 margin. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, it is it is very silly of her and immature that uh, she has made a scene when it really is, there's nothing to, to complain about. Now, there is some uh, good news for the uh, Victorian Liberals. The marginal seat of Latrobe held by Jason Wood, that's become a bit safer. And the seat of Chisholm held by Julia Banks has become a bit safer for the Liberals. And also the safe Labour seats of Isaacs held by uh, Mark Dreyfus and uh, Hotham held by uh, Claire O'Brien, I think her name is. Uh, they have become uh, more marginal, uh, but uh, you... Uh, with the, the polls the way they are, you you know you wouldn't think that the Liberals have much to celebrate there for the time being. Yeah, I don't think they do either. I uh, when I look at that, I mean the the two Liberal seats in question there is um, fairly safe Liberal, but depending on how bad they perform in the next election, that could really be brought down to marginal. And you know you, you just never know. Labor could be able to swing them enough to 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 just narrowly gain them. Uh, when it comes to the Labor seats, I mean that, that that doesn't matter at all. I mean even though those seats have gone down from very safe to mildly safe, when it comes to percentages, it still isn't going to be enough for Liberal to win um, seats like Hoffman, for instance. Uh, they, they've always been safe Labor seats, and even with uh, the margin that it has been reduced to, it, it won't make any difference at all. And also interesting, the, the new seat of Fraser, which even though Malcolm Fraser was a Liberal Prime Minister, he's going to uh, be named after a safe uh, Labor seat. Now, that is actually... Uh, next door to Bill Shorten's electorate of Maribyrnong. Uh, his electorate is basically being split in half. Half is going to be Maribyrnong and half is going to be Fraser. But the Fraser half is going to be a lot safer. And so there's been a lot of speculation where whether Bill Shorten will jump over to Fraser to, to make sure he's got a safer margin. Well, he could do that. He's definitely an opportunist. So I wouldn't be surprised to me. But... The thing is, really, whether he stays or goes, he's going to make a change because even if he was to stay in uh, Maribyrnong, he would still win that seat quite comfort comfortably. So he doesn't really have to make that change. And he's always been the member for Maribyrnong, so you'd think he would stay there rather than wanting to um, change and, and for people to call him an opportunist and, and say, you know, that he was, he was scared and he was running away from the electorate and wanted to change, even though it was split in half, uh, to change seat name isn't normally the best look. So he really should stay where he is because he's, he's not going to lose it anyway, um, considering how well he's doing in the polls so far. Um, with the Fraser name, actually, yeah, it's, it, it is very interesting that they chose such a seat for Malcolm Fraser. I mean, when they um, chose Gough Whitlam, uh, Gough Whitlam's seat, even though it wasn't in the area he, uh, he contested, it was actually about an hour or so away from where he was based in, in Sydney. Um, in the in the seat of Wollongong is where where Whitlam uh, got got his, uh, his seat renamed, but uh, that was still a safe, very safe Labor seat. Whereas this one here, they've made a, a Liberal Party 
uh, Prime Minister, um, they, they, they named a, a, a safe Labor seat after him, which is really strange. I mean, I, I thought they would have perhaps um, changed it to um, to a seat where it was more of a, a, a Liberal one that, that might have been still uh, close to where Malcolm Fraser was originally um, originally had contested in the past and it kept to that rather than having to completely change it. It, it sort of doesn't really have any significance now. Let's turn to the ACT now, which has gone from two electorates to three with the new electorate of uh, Bean. But they're, they're all safe Labour. Uh, some are more safer than others, but it's basically ACT Labour is going to have an extra MP to put into Parliament. Exactly. Uh, ACT, always a, a very left-wing stronghold. It's uh, just an extra seat in the bag for Labour that they don't have to work hard for. So really, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nothing for the Liberals to celebrate, that's for sure. There has been speculation that maybe the Greens could pick up one of these uh, three seats, but you know, they're, they're always talking about, oh, you know, the Greens on the march in, you know, inner Melbourne, inner Sydney and the ACT, but, you know, that's wishful thinking. Yeah, well, you know, you would actually think that the Greens would perform well. I, I haven't seen them get big numbers in the past in the ACT, and you would think they would because they're very left leaning. I mean, the ACT is very similar in demographic to say uh, uh, inner city Melbourne and inner city city. Um, so it, it is strange that they haven't performed to a, a high expectation, but um, it, you just have to see, I mean, they have been gaining ground. So it, it would be interesting if, if they did, but um, they, they might it might just take a lot of time for them to to be able to perform because the demographic really is there so you would expect them to perform better than they have in the past now let's turn to south australia which uh, was reduced from 11 uh, seats uh, down to 10 uh, despite the change of government the the state's decline uh, continues they were at uh, 12 seats as recently as uh, 2004. Now, there was a lot of speculation about which seat would be abolished, but it's the seat of Port Adelaide uh, held by Labor Party President Mark Butler, which is being uh, abolished. Uh, most of that is being absorbed into the neighbouring uh, seat of Hindmarsh, which was it's held by Steve Georgianis by 0.1%. Uh, but now that goes, the margin for that goes to 10%. And the uh, seat of uh, Adelaide, which uh, Kate Ellis is the Labor member, she is retiring. Uh, that's got a bit safer for Labor. Uh, her retirement basically means that there, there's no losers from this redistribution, but there'll be a bit of a seat merry-go-round because, you know, Mark Butler, you know, might want the, the safest because uh, th there's another new seat, Spence, which is the, the safest. And he might think, you know, I'm Labor Party president, you know, shadow cabinet minister. Um, you know, I deserve a, a safer seat. So it's just a matter of, you know, who who, who gets the, the new seats. Yeah, that, that's correct. I mean, it is strange though how they really um, are always fighting over these so-called, you know, extra safe seats. I mean, all those seats are very safe there for them. I, I see the Liberals really having a lot of problems in the future in South Australia because they just haven't, with this redistribution, um, got much uh, room to move. I mean, apart from the couple of seats there that they have, and I mean, Pine isn't really, you know, he, he's not a, a popular member, um, but he's still hanging in there. So, I mean, it, it's, apart from those couple of seats the Liberals have, I mean, the Labor Party uh, are running... SA uh, similar to how they're, they're running Victoria. I mean, they've got a, a, the majority, they've got a big big margin of, of seats there. And um, the redistribution has hurt them. I, um, it, it's, it, I find it funny how uh, Mark Butler and others uh, are really trying to chase the safest seat because even if they weren't to get the safest, um, all of them are safe enough for them to, to not lose out. So it really is uh, just showing their the egos and uh, and just, just the politics of, of how, how all this is, you know, I mean, it's really ridiculous. 
Now, there was a lot of speculation, and I think more hoping that Christopher Pine's seat of Sturt would be abolished, and everyone was thinking, you know, what, what what's he going to do? You know, is the career politician, how would he get another yeah. seat? But his seat's margin has been uh, largely untouched, and so is the, the neighbouring uh, seat of uh, Boothby, held by a uh, young uh, conservative liberal, uh, Nicole Flint. So uh, there, there's not going to be a... Uh, SA liberal uh, ship fight there. Yeah, that could that could I mean uh, at least be uh, one less worry for them. Uh, but yeah, I mean there's not many seats that the Liberals have, so um, there's not much they can gain really out of that state. They, they just um, can really just defend what they've got, and it's going to be very difficult for them in the future with the redistribution that has occurred for them to gain the seats that they need to form government. Now, uh, if you've been following this uh, conversation, you will have noticed that uh, two, oh, one state and one territory have gained a seat each and one state has lost one, which means we're going to be getting an extra seat in the House of Representatives the next election. The, uh, it, in it increases the House from 150 to 151, which uh, will you know, increase the expense on the tax fire. You'll have to pay a new MP and you know, all his uh, staff as well and, and, and travel. So um, yeah, increasing the size of the parliament, it's always you know, controversial. Yeah, I mean, the, the 150 number did sound nice and neat. 151 now, which is going to be a lot harder for people to, uh, to draw out statistics and everything. I mean, um, it is the argument to be made that um, there can't be a tie now. So it, there might be a little bit more, um, uh, I guess you could say, um, a relief there. But in saying that, there's still going to be uh, cross benches. So in, in the future, hung parliaments are still on the on, on the possibility there. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how it works and how it all fits in the new parliament. But like you said, I mean, making uh, making it bigger and adding people in there isn't really going to uh, benefit us in any way. Uh, now, the election pendulum has changed uh, because of this redistribution. The coalition now has 75 seats, so they've lost their uh, majority on paper. Labor has gone up to 71 seats, and there's uh, five cross benches. So basically, to you know, win re-election, the, the coalition, they have to win more seats. That's right. And I mean, if Labor um, was to get the support of all those crossbenchers, then the coalition lose. Um, in saying that, though, I mean, the, the Labor Party are going to gain enough seats in their own right, I believe, because when you're looking at the, the extra seats that they've gained here, plus the, the many swings that they're going to get around the country, it's going to be very, very easy for them to, to, to be able to win government. It's... Um, I mean, last time round, Malcolm Turnbull just snuck in. So this time round, he's going to lose heavily. And it's not going to be because of the Labor Party winning, but uh, more so the Liberal Party losing. It's uh, not because the Labor Party have really showed any uh, any uh, strength in their policies or if they, or, or then that the, the people can really say, oh, yeah, these guys are representing us, that they're doing a good job. It's just that the Liberal Party's under Turnbull are so bad that uh, a lot of people are just willing to vote the other way just to get rid of him and, and try and rejuvenate the Liberal Party for next time round. Uh, that uh, segues nicely into our next segment, which is uh, Malcolm Turnbull was in the shadow of the 30 consecutive news poll losses uh, this week, and uh, Tony Abbott uh, made sure that you know he was fully aware of that. Uh, even though Tony Abbott was on the the poly pedal, he made sure he kept up his media appearances. Still talked about uh, uh, energy policy. You know we uh, that we needed a uh, new coal fired power station. And even uh, discussed the possibility of compulsory compulsory acquiring uh, the Liddell Power Station in New South Wales uh, uh, to stop AGL basically shutting it down and blowing it up and uh, making making less coal-fired power in Australia. Uh, but uh, probably what took the, the news this week was a alleged cabinet leak that Peter Dutton wanted a cut in the 
immigration intake by 20,000, it would have gone from 190,000 to 170,000. Now, Turnbull and Bishop, uh, they were pretty strongly saying this didn't go to cabinet. It was fake news. But Dutton said, you know, I talked about it with, you know, cabinet uh, colleagues. So it certainly was a point of conversation uh, around, you know, cabinet, even though it wasn't you know, it didn't happen at the cabinet table. So there were discussions. It just wasn't uh, minuted. And uh, it, if you recall when Tony Abbott uh, suggested that we reduce the uh, immigration intake, he was, you know, slapped down by, you know, Scott Morrison, uh, Steve Chobo, uh, and, you know, really eviscerated. But this uh, revelation shows that, you know, there is a bit of, you know, division in the, in the Turnbull government about what to do on the immigration question. Yeah, so when it comes to um, the migration intake, I mean, we, we've had a lot of members of the government uh, not on board with the rest of the, um, the country on this issue. We've had, for instance, Julie Bishop continuing to advocate for foreign aid, which has uh, resulted in a, a big loss of money that has gone to other countries. We have uh, also on the immigration issue in itself, uh, 20,000, I mean, 20,000, only a reduction of 10%. That, that's not a lot. And we've got, for instance, the Australian Conservatives, they've come out and um, previously said that they would wish to half the immigration intake, to um, halving it by 50%. And even that, by many measures, isn't really enough because we have a lot of problems in this country. We have strong unemployment rate. We have... Uh, uh, a lot of people doing it tough. I mean, the the moment you keep on bringing immigrants into this country, there's two things that can happen here. Number one, if they are going into the workforce, they are competing with people that are already looking for jobs here, and there's not enough jobs in supply for the amount of demand. And second of all, if they're not getting into work, then they're going straight on to welfare, which is costing us money and putting us into further debt and causing us problems and grief. So, I mean, really, we should sort the country out in itself right now, make sure that there is jobs going around for people, that everybody's comfortable. And once we're in that situation, then they could look at bringing immigrants in that are um, when we really need them, like post-World War II, when, when there was a situation where we really needed the work, workers to come in because we didn't have enough people. But we're, we're living in times where we've got more people than there are jobs. So we can't afford to continue bringing people over here. And especially the, the people, the types of people that do come here, which um, unfortunately there has been a lot of issues as, as we've seen in Victoria and other places where people have been involved in crime. So there's a lot of issues that need to be sorted here. Uh, going back to looking at this through the prism of the, the Liberal leadership, it was interesting Tony Abbott deliberately said that on this issue he was in the Peter Dutton camp, which seems to suggest that I think Tony Abbott's aware that he's not going to become Prime Minister again, but that that would suggest he sort of switched to you know Peter Dutton as the anointed uh, Conservative successor uh, to Turnbull if it you know continues to go downhill. Yeah, I, th I think uh, people have come to that realisation. I mean, you could never say never. I mean, there could be a, a, a situation in the future where he may be able to come back. But in saying that, I mean, all you have to do is look at Howard and how he was able to come back many times, even when he was uh, knocked out and down. Um, but I mean, in saying that, Dutton has really gotten the spotlight at the moment. He's uh, very popular amongst the base of uh, Liberal Party supporters. So it wouldn't surprise me that he is going to be uh, one of the contenders. It's up to him in the end of the day whether he chooses to contest and, and challenge Turnbull and when it is that he does so. I mean, it's up to him. If he doesn't, then they have to look to other, other people that, that might be interested. Because, I mean, you've already had Joyce come out and, and say, you know, he has to Christmas, which still is a long way away. But um, th there is, you know, I mean, the whole 30 news poll argument, it really is a slap in the face to him. I mean, for him to um, ask somebody, and that was one of the main reasons he used, I mean, you know, he's gone through the exact same thing. So, I mean, people could say, well, you know, you used this argument on somebody else. So you should 
step aside and, and put and give the baton to someone else as well, you know, and, uh, and be only fair that way. And it, it just a really the only the only thing that the party needs is for somebody to really um, get behind a successor, um, united behind somebody, and for that person to really um, be determined to take down Turnbull, um, whether they choose to do that or whether they may choose to see Turnbull go to an election, lose, and then take over as opposition leader in a nice, clean sort of fashion. And um, then in the future, down the line, then try and um, defeat Short. And that might be a, another situation that somebody would rather do rather than having to um, get the, the sort of dirty, um, the dirty claws out and, and backstab like uh, we have seen in the past. Yeah, I thought Joyce uh, setting out the Christmas deadline, it might already be too late by that time because uh, starting from early August, uh, Malcolm Turnbull can, you know, rush off and call an election if he thinks that his leadership's uh, under threat. So Joyce has basically said, oh, we'll give you until then. Uh, Turnbull, if he's if he's still behind uh, before Christmas, then he'll, he'll probably rush to the governor general uh, and call an election because he'd rather, you know, take a risk he might lose at a, a federal election rather than the humiliation of being rolled by his own colleagues. No, that's exactly right, and he would do that for sure. No, no problems are, are fair. I mean, I, I think that if the if there was enough dissent within the party for them to choose to roll him, I think the time has to be mid year that they do this. I mean, it still gives Turnbull a couple of months, and mid year would still ensure that the uh, leadership of uh, a new person going into the helm of leadership. Uh, would be fairly fresh and that, for instance, uh, it, it would sort of um, up to the next election could be within, say, six, nine months away or even less if they chose to go to an early election, but it would give them still um, a, a fresh start and that they wouldn't be in the job for so long that people would get bored of them very quickly. So, I mean, mid-year, so say around the June area, somewhere around that is is what they need to to capitalise on if they were serious. Um, otherwise, like I said, maybe they wish to just have him lose and get rid of him altogether uh, from politics. And once that was to occur, um, then, you know, the right person going in as opposition leader, um, you know, being under Labor for three years, you know, sort of biting the tongue and then slowly going back to government. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of ways they could go about this. But at the end of the day, it's whether they're serious or not in doing it or whether they're just sort of, you know, um, creating hype that isn't really there. Now, let's turn our attention to some migrants that were actually quite keen on getting, and that is the, the persecuted white South African farmers who are risking uh, violence, uh, torture, and uh, murder if they remain in uh, South Africa. There's been a lot of support uh, in Australia to bring them here as uh, refugees. There were rallies in uh, Brisbane and Perth. And now it has been confirmed that the federal government has received uh, applications for asylum from uh, persecuted white South African farmers. Peter Dutton, despite saying that he you know, wanted to look at fast-tracking humanitarian visas, it turns out his department has already rejected one. And, you know, that's not, for all the talk, uh, that, that's not a promising start. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of support out here, especially amongst his base. Um, that we should be allowing um, South African farmers into the country. Because um, apart from the fact that um, they're, they're going through such a chaotic time over there, um, uh, another thing to be noted where a lot of people make the point is that these type of people would be able to um, fit in to the, to the country very well, being of European um, origin and also uh, being farmers. So, for instance, you could make the argument that uh, they would be able to go out in the regional areas and uh, actually um, become very useful in building on our farms, our agriculture industry, and helping us and the country a lot. You know, I mean, they could do a lot of work because that, that's that's what they do. I mean. Um, they aren't, um, you know, refugees that uh, don't work and that, you know, um, 
uh, involved in crime or anything like that, like a lot of the other ones are. But of course, you're going to continue to have people on the left that uh, cry racism. And it seems to me that, I mean, in uncertain terms, but that they want to or would rather, um, instead of having good uh, immigrants come over, they would rather have bad ones. And I, I don't really understand that. I mean, I'm not a fan of um, immigration at all because I would rather get this country back on track rather than get anybody over here. But if we had to um, bring people over here, then I'd rather the right people come over here. And rights being people that are going to contribute and um, and uh, not get into crime and not harm others and actually, you know, uh, be well and fit into our society. Now, there was an alleged chemical uh, weapons attack in uh, Douma in Syria last Saturday, which uh, allegedly was carried out by the Assad regime. It's always weird that uh, Assad, he uses uh, chemical weapons when he's just about to win. And uh, of course, the the images of the, the suffering uh, children were beamed, ar beamed around the, the world. And uh, this has caused uh, Donald Trump, despite saying he was always against intervention in Syria, launching uh, another uh, missile strike on uh, alleged chemical weapons uh, facilities. They launched, uh, it was actually a coalition between the US, Britain and France, launched 105 missiles uh, into uh, Syria, uh, which uh, it is claimed that uh, 71 of those were uh, sh shot down. Now, uh, a lot of Trump supporters are feeling let down again. Now, despite what uh, you know, the mainstream media will tell you, uh, Trump supporters, they're not mindless zombies. Uh, Ann Coulter and Tucker Carlson, for example, were uh, making the case against intervention in Syria uh, all week. And uh, there's a lot of people who you know, do feel uh, betrayed by this. Uh, and a lot, a lot of people are also wondering, it's, it's only been a week since uh, John Bolton, the, probably the worst neoconservative that ever existed, was appointed National Security Advisor, and we, we've seen you know, 100 plus missiles launched into Syria. Exactly. I mean, Trump has really let down his base. He, um, he all, when, when he was running for election, he was supposed to be an anti-establishment guy. He was supposed to be the guy that was for the working man. He was supposed to be making his own rules. Oh, he can't be bought because he's full of money. But I mean, we, we continue seeing these kind of incidents where it seems like he's just doing whatever, you know, other people are telling him to do. And they're not the, obviously the right thing to do because they can cause an outright war. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, there was no proof or evidence that the chemical attack took place. Well, I mean, not that Assad was behind it anyway. And Assad actually came out and said, no, you know, this didn't happen. It was fabricated. And this happened exactly the same time last year as well. And I've noticed as well that uh, exactly a year ago when this actually happened was when a lot of his core supporters started to stray away from Trump because they said, no, you know, that... They, they were against war. They were against intervention. They didn't want war with, with or getting involved in Middle East at all. Um, and by him doing that, it's really um, just shown him to be a, a neocon. And th this is what his base supporters was against. They didn't want that traditional Republican neocon um, person representing them. And that's why they picked Trump as a, uh, a Republican candidate, because they didn't, they wanted something different. So um, him doing that it just doesn't make any sense. He's, he's following other people's orders. He's not, you know, taking control and doing what is right. He's going to cause uh, mayhem for nothing. Uh, Russia's going to get involved. It's, it's going to be chaos. A lot of people have dug up uh, old tweets of uh, Trump uh, from uh, five or six years ago talking about how attacking Syria was a, uh, a bad idea. And now he's uh, been on Twitter this year 
week calling, you know, uh, he's given Assad a nickname, Animal Assad, and, you know, he's really threatened Russia saying, you know, beware, you know, we're going to, you know, launch uh, missiles there. And of course, you know, Russia has been the, the biggest supporter of the Assad uh, regime. And so there's been a lot of uh, World War Three panic that, you know, the uh, Cold War that seems to have reemerged between the uh, United States and Russia could turn into a hot war. Now, I think this is uh, overblown a bit. Russia uh, is still taking a measured response saying, you know, we're not happy with this, you know, we promise, you know, repercussions, but, you know, we're, we're not down in the, uh, the nuclear bunker yet. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what will it take for them to get down to that uh, stage? I mean, it, it, I mean, Trump did say that this was a one-off thing, but I mean, what was it? What was it supposed to prove? Like, what? Why is it that he did it? I mean, especially since the media has gone all quiet on the uh, on the attack, uh, the chemical attack, it's all sort of died down now, and it's always been alleged. It's always been alleged that they've never been able to actually prove or link it to Assad, and Assad's just downright denied it. I mean, normally when people do things like this, they would actually come out and say, yep, you know, I've done this. Like, I mean, you see it all the time with, uh, when it comes to ISIS, for instance, when they claim uh, responsibility for attacks, they always come out and say, yep, we did this. You know, they don't, you know, deny it and say, no, no, it wasn't us. I mean, it's, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I mean, people have to obviously, there's another thing they have to understand is that Assad being there is is keeping that country together. I mean, he actually protects minority groups like Christians um, more than any other leader does. And having um, people in power like Assad means that uh, terrorist groups don't take control. I mean, whenever the Americans have gone into the Middle East and have tried to tear down dictators, um, and put in their own little puppet leaders and stuff, then the, the country's just gone into shambles. I mean, we've seen that in, in Iraq. We've seen that in uh, areas like Libya, um, Egypt, for instance, like just ongoing chaos because the Americans had to go in and put their stamp on the country when it has nothing to do with them. They shouldn't be in there. Let the people govern themselves and do whatever they want in their own countries. You do whatever you want in your country. And I mean, like I said, uh, it's, it's keeping the country together and as soon as you tear someone down like Assad you'll have people like ISIS just gaining control and the country's just going to go turn into a hellhole it's just going to be ridiculous because people like him are, are, are stopping terrorist groups from actually controlling the country you know so for it just seems to me like it's um, shooting yourself in the foot, really. You, you, you're you going to tear down a leader that is um, stopping these uh, these groups from rising, you know, and um, as soon as you as soon as you get rid of him, then this is what's going to happen. You know, we've seen this before and they just don't learn and they, they continue to, for whatever their agenda purpose is, um, going to um, intervene into the Middle East and different countries, and they've got no business being there. Now, a lot of people have been speculating what's this reason for the sudden change in policy from Trump. Uh, the, the Mueller investigation is still ongoing and it's becoming more invasive. It's, it's going from Russia into investigating Trump's business dealings and even, you know, looking into, you know, Stormy Daniels. It just seems to be, you know, investigating any possible wrongdoing uh, Trump's uh, ever done. And there's also that, you know, he could be you know, bl blackmailed by uh, the U.S. deep state, they might have you know uncovered some uh, you know incriminating evidence. I, I speculated that you know maybe it was uh, the U.S. authorities that had the uh, so-called PP taper all along. Is it a you know distraction because uh, from what's going on in the United States, or uh, is it another one of Trump's famous 5D chess moves? Uh, well, I mean, how many chess moves has he got? Because I've, I've been hearing about this for a good year now that um, he's playing some sort of game. But it, it, it's coming to a stage where we're thinking, well, I mean, you could play a game for so long. And if you were meant to be, um, how can I say, uh, trying to get the right outcome, it would have come about, I mean, by now you would think. I mean, it's... Uh, how how long can you play this game? How many lives have to suffer for, from from this chess game? I mean, it's um, 
either it's a distraction, like you mentioned, um, for what is going on over there, or it's um, it's just um, well, I mean, it's very hard to speculate what it is. I mean, they, these things, I mean, it could possibly be like you were saying, a, a blackmail tactic, and uh, maybe that's why. I mean, a lot of people are saying um, either um, two things that Trump is, uh, you know, somehow an establishment guy that um, tricked every or con people. And that he was always behind, you know, um, invading um, the Middle East and getting involved in these wars. And another tactic that a lot of people are saying is that uh, he was um, wanting to do the right thing, but um, that there was other forces involved that uh, were blackmailing him, perhaps, uh, or, you know, trying to force him to change tactics and uh, getting involved and do things which were against his values. I mean, either way, the guy is um, obviously doing things that he said previously he wouldn't do. He's doing things that are against what his previous values were. So, I mean, what does he have to stand for now? I mean, it's uh, it's clear to me that uh, a politician that sells out in any way, whether it's uh, because they feel they're forced to or because, you know, it's um, they were always part of it in the first place, they aren't representing the people, they aren't doing their job. And it it's just people are really getting fed up with this. I mean, you are going to have your um, uh, neocon types that are going to be backing him, but um, unfortunately, you know, um, their their intelligence um, of of those people aren't really great. I mean, it's uh, for for for, the, for these people to um, to be backing uh, these kind of acts that are going to cause you know a world war three. It's to me, it doesn't. I mean, it just shows how stupid these people are. I mean, that that. I mean, why would you, just for the sake of, you know, I mean, having this hysteria of, oh, you know, uh, hating uh, Islam, for instance. So that means, yeah, we'll go into a, a Middle Eastern country and just, you know, cause havoc just for the sake of it. I mean, there's no no reason for it, and there's going to be a lot of consequences out of it as well. Now, I thought we'd finish off with a regressives update, and uh, there, there's been a lot in Australia who have returned to uh, prominence this week, uh, no more so than Yasmin abdul uh who famously said Islam is the most uh, feminist religion, and uh, lest we forget all the uh, injustices against uh, Muslims on Anzac Day. Uh, I was actually disappointed she didn't win the Unshackled's Regressive of the Year last year. I thought she would have been a worthy winner. But the ABC uh, has rehired her to host a new TV show, a hijab uh, fashion show called Hijabists. Uh, now, uh, many have been highlighting that this show you know, is inappropriate given that the hijab is you know, oppressive uh, to women uh, in a lot of uh, Middle Eastern countries, you know, women uh, are forced to, to wear it. And it was interesting that in the, the promotional video that Yasmin uh, released, she even wore the niqab, which uh, also covers uh, everything except the eyes, which is even uh, more oppressive. So it's, it's not really, uh, uh, it's not really promoting the, the liberation of, you know, women in Islam very much. No, it's well, what what it is is really just trying to um, to to stir people, um, cause tension. It's uh, trying to divide the communities, and um, I mean she does a good job at that. And other people, I mean, you, you see on the project and all those kind of TV shows, they they're all doing that. I mean, rather than um, having uh, people, you know, um, you know, united between, mm -hmm. you know, for, for particular causes. I mean, she. She's obviously, you know, doing things that, uh, you know, are, are trying to gain, um, you know, shares. And, you know, she wants people, for instance, to, to be outraged by this. I mean, that, that's the whole, the whole gimmick here. I mean, she um, is going to have people that support, you know, support her, obviously, for doing it. But she also wants that crowd of people, you know, that um, are also going to be rallying against it and making a big scene because, I mean, these type of people love popularity, whether it's good or bad. They just want to be, you know, talked about. And not only that, she's achieving division. She's going to have, you know, uh, she's going to be able to then point fingers out and say, oh, you know, look at all these racists and, and you know, these, you know, patriot groups, these bigots and all. So, I mean, this is a, a good way to um, poke people and 
she she gets them to react and then she's going to point the finger at them and say oh look at look at all these people you know um coming out and you know saying this and saying that and i mean it's a tactic that's it's going to work unfortunately because rather than people ignoring her and for you know ratings to you know fail and not exist and then for her to disappear in existence uh people are going to react to it and when they react it's going to um you know put her in the spotlight even if it's on on a negative spotlight and it's going to, in turn, um, make these uh, groups come out um, and, you know, hate her, hate Muslims more and all the rest of it. Then in turn, it's going to get people on the other side hating then the patriots and then the people on the right. And it's just causing a chaotic environment. So, I mean, she's, you know, it's typical. She's getting what she wants, uh, getting her name out there and also causing uh, havoc within the community. Uh, now, later in the week, uh, she was uh, denied entry into the United States, and she suggested it was due to you know, racism and Islamophobia of the Trump administration, and so did Greens leader Richard Di Natale. But it turned out she had the wrong visa. She was on a tourist visa, and of course she was uh, uh, doing uh, speaking engagements while she was there, which she would be receiving money on, uh, which you uh, can't do on a tourist visa. So so, uh, United States said, no, um, out you go. And she said, oh, but I've traveled on this uh, visa before. Uh, but the thing is, the, the U.S. authorities would have cottoned on to the fact that, you know, last time you did that, you were earning money from speaking engagements. So it's simply that, you know, she didn't play by the, the proper visa rules. Well, not only that, but uh, I'm actually not, not surprised that they wouldn't want her there in the first place. I mean, she's... She's not, I wouldn't call her a talent. And I mean, fair enough. I mean, I'll put my bias aside here. I mean, there is plenty of people on the left and the right that you could say, oh, you know, this person is, um, you know, a talented person in what they do, you know, when it comes to their job occupation. I mean, and she isn't, you know, I mean, it's, she's just basically your, your average uh, uni student, um, you know, um, extreme leftist um, that has just been handpicked for whatever reason, I'm guessing based on her um, minority um, attributes, and she's been placed on, on such a pedestal. And it's not because she's uh, at all earned it or because she should be there uh, because of talent wise. I mean, it's uh, purely based on who she is rather than uh, what she is able to uh, contribute and um, when it comes to her occupation. So it, it really is ridiculous how, how she's getting paid to do any talks at all really i mean um, people shouldn't be paying attention to her and uh the more we do then um i mean it's just yeah the, the more popularity she's getting so the best thing to do is just uh you know put her in the in the back of our heads and just you know shut off and you know um hopefully one day she'll just delete from existence and another uh, leading Australian regressive, uh, Tim Supamsani, who's the uh, race discrimination uh, commissioner. I'm glad I'm able to pronounce his name right now because uh, he <laughs> says uh, that's racist. He uh, released a report this week, uh, or had the authority of the Australian Human Rights Commission, funded by uh, the taxpayers, of course, which uh, said that you know we're still a you know. A country where white people have all the power because uh, non-European and indigenous people make up 24% of the Australian population, yet they only account for 5% uh, of senior leaders in politics, business and uh, academia. And and so the media reported, oh, Australia still practices, you know, the, the white Australia policy, but they only picked three occupations, politics, business and academia. Like, why not pick, you know, small business where there's a lot of, you know, Asian and Indians engaged in that or medicine or accountancy or, or other you know finance i mean it's it seems very selective well i wonder i wonder how um the percentages would look if they uh calculated um who was working in petrol stations for instance i mean i'm pretty sure um if they were to look at 7-eleven workers um they wouldn't have many whites working in there I mean, also, if you if you wanted to look at doctors, I mean, there is a lot of Indian doctors, I mean, and good on them. I mean, you know, oh, I don't have any issue with that, but I'm just making a fact here that um, there's a big percentage of doctors that are uh, Indian. So, I mean, uh, you know, they're, they're only looking at particular uh, fields rather than all fields. I mean, um, you know, this is, this is a thing, handpicking 
certain things to uh, cater to their agenda. You know, I mean, uh, making things look bad or worse than is. Um, there, there's plenty of, um, you know, if they were looking at call centres, I'm sure there wouldn't be many white people working in call centres either. So, um, you know, this, this is, like I said, I mean, you know, handpicking things. Um, and, I mean, this is Australia, by the way. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, we would expect, uh, you know, white people to be a majority here because, I mean, it was based... Um, you know, on on uh, British settlement and, you know, um, obviously, you know, over time, you know, uh, more Europeans came during the wars and everything. And, um, you know, it, it's it's just always been um, uh, a lot of people from, uh, from European heritage here. Uh, if you were to go over to another country overseas, I mean, um, you know, why isn't it that they're making that kind of argument over in uh, South Africa when it comes to um, the, the Boas, for instance? Uh, why aren't they saying that the, the Boas should be, uh, you know, in more higher positions when it comes to government or, um, you know, considering they're only a minority group uh, when it comes to uh, any other country, whether it be in Africa or in Asia? I mean, those countries there are largely, you know, fairly homogenous. Um, I mean, if you were to go to China, it's largely Chinese. I mean, there wouldn't be many people there advocating for minority groups to uh, to be, you know, starting to gain higher positions. But uh, for some reason in Australia or whether it be in the US or, you know, countries like this, it, it seems to be an issue for them. And I don't understand why. It's uh, a double standard. It's, um, you know, for, for, for certain countries, you can largely have a majority and, you know, uh, minority people getting involved and doing their thing without any sort of, you know, uh, attempted takeover. But then in other countries, it's uh, discriminating or, you know, you have to have quotas, for instance. It's, um, it's just a ridiculous uh, double standard. Uh, the reason why the, uh, the Human Rights Commission, they, they commission reports such as this is to give their, you know, claims that Australians are so racist and bigoted, we need all these laws against, uh, you know, free speech and other affirmative actions program to give it the air of authority. But as we've just done, it's so easy to debunk these reports. And you remember last year, there was the one about the so-called, you know, rape epidemic on Australian university campuses, which said that 50% of women at university had been sexually harassed, which included things such as staring and only had a 9.7% response rate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's crazy. I mean, to think that that many people and I mean, yeah, you know, to include staring in, in the in the uh, in an actual, uh, you know, so-called rape epidemic. I mean, it's it, they, they just will continue to try to do anything to uh, push their their extreme views, uh, whether it be um, on racial grounds, on, uh, you know, the feminist cause or, uh, you know, like you said, to deny free speech. Um, so that certain views are suppressed uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, openly engaging in political discussion or just, you know, in public. Uh, they want to create a society that is dumbed down and um, for people to, um, you know, toe a particular line for nobody to have, you know, freedom of thought where they can sort of think for themselves. Um, it's very scary to, to see what the future holds for us. Well, Damien, I've appreciated you uh, coming on the, the show today to uh, dissect the week with me. We certainly covered uh, a lot and, uh, yeah, we'll uh, certainly uh, have you on the show again and uh, there, there'll be plenty of news for, for us to go through in the future. Yeah, no worries. It was great to be here, mate. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. Myself and Unshackled contributor Logan Spaulding attended the Justice for Jalal rally on Sunday. It was a very touching event. You can see the videos, including our interview with Jalal's mother, Olivia Yazin, on our YouTube channel. Our next event is the Rally Against Safe Schools this Saturday, the 21st of April at 1pm at Victoria's Parliament House. It is being held to coincide with the National Sex Ed Sit-Out, which is on Monday, April 23rd. So I hope you can join us for that event as well. Our friends at Liberty Works have got two upcoming events. The first is the Sydney launch of Manus Days, the untold story of Manus Island. You remember we interviewed the author Michael Coates on episode 140. It is being launched by News Corp journalist Miranda Devine on April 26 at 6pm at the Metropolitan Hotel in Sydney. 
Then there is also uh, a Jew, Muslim, and Christian walk into a bar featuring Avi Yemeni, Imam Taudi, and Kira Lee Smith with, with Professor James Al Allen as the Devil's Advocate. It is on Thursday the 17th of May at 7pm at the Mount Gravit Bowls Club in Brisbane. Uh, Sydney and Melbourne events will be announced shortly. Tickets can be bought for both at libertyworks.org.au. Also, don't forget, if you want to take The Unshackled even further and score some awesome rewards, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Don't forget, we also have our online store, Upright Market, where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.